So right now we're gonna actually dig into the mechanics of how I see the whole theory of blending colors in reality. I learned this, or I think I learned this. I'm not sure about anything, keep that in mind. This is just what I suppose. I learned this somewhat of a theory when I worked in 3D with 3D rendering and compositing and all that. In 3D there's a thing called passes. And passes mean that everything that's being rendered is segregated to certain layers. And when we combine all of them, we get the final result. And there are certain rules of how we have to combine them. And that's perfectly represented into the system of Photoshop layers. And that's what I did. I just repeated everything in Photoshop. Okay, for explanation, let's render a donut. Okay, so this is a perfect donut. So at first we're creating the opaque silhouette of the object, a so-called alpha pass. Okay, this pass defines where object exists and where it doesn't exist on the surface of the canvas. Now, next we create a new layer and we clip mask one to another. Now, right now it's a completely black object because we don't even know what color this object is or anything. Because there's no light on it. It's in complete darkness right now. Now, in new layer, let's add one of the lights. So we, we select this layer and we choose the add mode. Add mode means adding value on top of everything that's underneath. I believe that's a mathematically correct way to combine lights. Not screen, not overlay, that stuff is not gonna work properly. So, add mode. Let's add an ambient light, the skylight. And let's add the sunlight also. I'm not sure about the brightness, but let's save this one. Never go too bright because uh, you don't wanna lose details. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, so, add mode. We're adding the skylight to the surface of the donut that's in complete darkness right now. Okay. Mm, kind of like this. Right now, we're only thinking about the skylight, which is a top hemisphere. Meaning, it's lighting up our donut from all the sides, but only from the top half. The bottom half of the ground, it doesn't emit any light. So everything that points down will be darker. And usually it's a good idea to go a bit darker when we're getting closer to the ground in general. To actually figure out how properly distribute the light on the surface, you should work a lot with painting from photo references. That's where you get the skill of understanding how the light distributes on the object. Well, I obviously need this a lot as well. Okay, so this was the first light. Adding another layer, also in add mode. And let's add the sunlight from everybody's favorite top left corner. Okay, this is the sunlight. It's kind of a little bit in front of the donut, so we'll see a little bit of the light hitting this area as well. And then we'll erase a little bit right here because there's a projected shadow from this point onto here. Donut is casting shadow on itself. Okay, this kind of looks properly, don't you think? We're not counting any reflexes yet. And a lot of times they are very subtle, so we don't have to think about them. Kind of, not really. But for now, let's keep it simple. Okay, let's create a new layer and make it in multiply mode. Now, multiply is multiplying the value underneath onto the value of the color defined in the layer of multiply. I don't know how mathematically appropriate to use multiply for filtering colors, but practically it appears to be the same effect that photo filtering does in real world. And that's the exact effect that the color of the object should make on the uh, light that hits the surface. So, so far what we did, we defined the transparency of the object, then we added ambient light, sunlight, then we filtered everything with this red color. And this is how we get the proper lighting of this red donut in the sky plus sunlight. To get a better effect, let's make red a little bit less vibrant, so we would see a slight difference in between warm sunlight and cold ambient light. What's really cool about the method of shading everything in separate layers, like when every light is in separate layer, right now, for instance, we can create the mask on the sunlight layer and paint what appears to be an actual shadow casted by something that's hiding the object from the sun. For instance, there's a giant dragon in the sky, and that's the shadow from its claws or something. 
And since I'm working in mask, I can turn off this shadow at any moment and I will get the perfectly clean sunlight on the donut. So we can change that, move it, and that's the actual projected shadow from something onto the donut. And we're not affecting ambient light as well. Ambient light is not a direct light, so it's not gonna cast a shadow. Okay, the last step. Let's create another layer on top of color and add highlights. Now, why are highlights on top of the color? Well, that's because this donut is... Dielectric, very good. There are two types of materials in this universe, dielectrics and conductors, or simply speaking, non-metals and metals. There's a lot of physical difference between the two, but for us, the important difference is non-metals don't affect the color of the highlight with the color of their own surface, and metals do. Now, let me illustrate what I mean. Let's create a very bright version of the sunlight and add a specular. Looks weird, doesn't it? Well, that's because the shadow from the claws should also remove the specular from the sunlight the same way. It's always the same way. If there's a projected shadow from the sunlight, there will be no highlight from this sunlight where the shadow is. So right now this looks more like it. The size and sharpness of the spot of the highlight depends on the roughness of the object. So right now this object is, uh, let's say, a plastic donut. Plastic is dielectric, non-metal. To turn this donut into red metal object, we move the highlight layer underneath the color layer. And this is the metallic red specular right now. I think. I'm not sure about anything. Now, since metals are usually a lot more reflective, let's add a whole bunch of different reflections. It's always a cool idea to add the rim reflection from the ambient light. This is probably the only way that you should render the reflection of the ambient light, the skylight. Rim reflection always looks pretty cool because this is a pretty beautiful effect that's called a Fresnel effect. It's also a very commonly used term in 3D graphics and it describes the nature of objects, of all the objects that surround us, absolutely everything, becomes more reflective at the angle. For instance, uh, this tablet. It has kind of a rubber plane at the back, and if you look at it like this, it's not really reflective. You don't see your own reflection, or the reflection of the camera right now. But if I move it like this, you can see the reflection of my face a little bit, and of my fingers. Almost clean reflection, it's really getting close to the mirror right now. For an L effect, everything becomes more reflective at the edge. And that's a very beautiful effect. Don't forget to use it when you finalize your painting. Now, one last thing. We wanted to create a red donut that is supposed to be of this color. Very bright color, isn't it? And the donut is super dark. Well, it's metallic right now, but even if we move everything outside and tone the reflection down a bit, it's still a very dark donut. Plastic red donut, almost pink donut, should be a lot brighter. Well, that's because there is a very nasty limitation in 8-bit color depth. I think I'm gonna talk about color depth in one of the episodes of this, because this is as nerdy as anything can possibly go. So this is a proper vlog for this. Okay, so let me first fix this and then I'll explain what I did. There we go, now this is a proper plastic pink donut lit by the sunlight. What I did is I increased exposure, like in the photo camera or anything. But I used levels because levels work faster than exposure adjustment layer. Trust me, I made a lot of experiments. So what I did is I lowered the white limit. So I said everything that's middle gray is going to be twice as bright, it's gonna be white. So that's how everything became brighter. Now this seems like a very complex and weird thing to add to the painting every time. And I do not encourage you in any way to actually paint things like this in segregated layers or whatever. Only if you're like creating something very idealized, like super perfect donut, not like this one, but you know what I mean. If it's a simple but a very clean object or composition, something not exactly realistic, then this is a good idea to go. But in general, you should just use the light palette or your own brains to create proper colors. Because using this, it's really hard to create a proper, dynamic, complex, 
character with background and everything because you will just get lost in layers and fixing everything. And there's a bunch of other limitations that I will talk about in further episodes. But right now the exposure layer is really necessary because if we will get back down to the light layers and we'll try to just increase the brightness of these lights to make the donut brighter without the use of the exposure layer. So right now we turned off the color layer so this is a white donut. How bright the white donut should be when there's just the skylight without the sunlight? Well, probably kind of like this. And then we add, we add the sunlight. And sunlight is a lot brighter than the skylight. So it's gonna be really bright. This kind of looks appropriate. Now let's filter this with the color of the donut and we'll get this. Kind of seems almost appropriate. Let's add everything else. And let's compare two donuts. The one that's made with bright lights and the other one that used dark lights and then increased exposure. So this juicy version is the exposure one. And it looks a lot better because it distorts colors properly. Meaning when we're blending two lights together, we immediately run into completely white color right here and we start to lose details. And that's a very nasty thing. That's what the limitation of 8-bit color depth is. When we meet perfectly white, that's it. Everything just turns into one value, just pure white. And there's no way to tone it down afterwards. But in this mode, if we will turn off the color, right now this is the white color. It's super bright. And it seems like it's lost all of its details. But if I'll add another layer on top of this whole brightness, but underneath this exposure layer, and I'll start just painting it with dark color, you'll see that we're getting all the details back. Because under the exposure layer, everything is pretty much normal. It's being overexposed later. And this is the only strategy that I came up with that actually allows to simulate the high dynamic range effect. So this is kind of an HDR painting. I hope I will be able to make sense of all the stuff that I told you today. So let's go through this again to make sure I didn't miss anything. So everything is segregated. First we create the transparency of the object, then we add one light, add another light, so these two are in add mode. Then we filter it down with the red color, then speculars, and then the exposure makes everything brighter. So painting this dark version, think about it as making a photo with wrong adjustments on your camera when everything is too dark. And then you just fix it by increasing the brightness. So this is how the whole thing works. This is how colors blend in my light palette. This is the basic mechanics. And this is how 3D rendering works as well. We have the geometry of the object, we have different lights lighting from different directions, we have the color of the object and its speculars, and then we adjust the brightness and compositing in 3D. That's how it's done. So basically the same thing. I used to paint a lot with this stuff. Let me actually show you a couple of paintings. I showed them in one of the episodes before. So look at these colors. This is all achieved using the HDR method. I'm not this good in understanding colors. I don't know how these exact colors turned out to be. I just knew that there is a color of the skin, there is a cold light from one side, there is a warm ambient light all over the place, and there is certain reflection and transparency, and I just added it on top one of the other, and then I got this color as a result. So I just defined the geometry and the proper logic of combining colors and lights, and the Photoshop got the final result without my participation. Yeah, by the way, about the gold, you see how skin has a very pale specular, like when the skin is red, the specular is very cool color. That's because the light is cool. Cool. But it doesn't work with gold this way, because gold is a conductor. Gold will filter the specular of this gold light with its own gold color. That's why gold always has golden shininess. So if we don't use the exposure thing, and right now we'll try to filter specs with the color, they will become super dark, and it absolutely doesn't matter how bright we'll make them underneath, even this almost white color, when we'll filter this with pink, you see that no matter how bright the spec is, even completely white, it will never get any brighter than this pink. 
because that's how multiply works. Multiply turns all the underneath colors into pink or darker. And that's where the exposure comes in, fixing everything back. Right now let's add another specular on top of the white object to illustrate it once more. And I'm adding it here even though I completely don't see any detail right now because it's too bright for a perfectly white object. I know it's gonna be a kind of a weird spot, but it doesn't matter. The point is, right now we're gonna shoot the golden color, which is, I'm not sure how much of a yellow should it be, I guess it depends on what kind of gold it is. So let's paint it down to the golden color. And here we go, all the details appear. Something like this. And if it's not enough, since it's just a simulation of HDR, for metal it's a very specific thing. It's kind of hard to render a proper bright metallic reflection in the fake HDR. But what we can do is make lights darker but keep specs a lot brighter and then just increase the exposure. And this gets a lot closer to what the actual metal specular is. And a bit of sky stuff as well. You see how the difference from the specular of the sky and the sun, even though they are filtered by the golden color, you can still see the difference, that the sky reflection is actually a lot cooler color. Let's add some of this, just some scratches to illustrate. Kinda looks like a golden donut. So, in conclusion, to create any surface, we have to define the lights separately, then add the specular and filter it with color underneath the specular or on top of it, depending on what type of material it is, conductor or dielectric, and then increase the brightness to the point where we wanna see it. Now, if you ask me, if you wanna homework, Try painting some objects, some simple objects, like a cup of coffee or something, using this method, and try to turn it into different materials and all that. And have a good practice to imprint it in your head, how lights combine, and what colors should you get in the results, and how different specular colors should be from the color of the surface of the object. Because this is the main basics of how you should render anything. Also, in this method, it's really easy to change the color of the object without affecting anything else. Well, because everything is segregated, but at a certain point you can kind of figure out the way to segregate only the color layer. So, for instance, right now I want to add some red paint on top of this uh, golden thing. So, some kind of a blood scattered all over this thing. It kind of looks weird because blood also should has its own specs and whatever. But this is really useful to, for instance, when you need to create the print on the shirt of a character without affecting all the wrinkles and lighting on them. You'll just paint in this layer and everything will be fine. You won't affect anything else. All the lights are in place and we just move around the colors. Black magic, isn't it? Okay, my voice is dying and I want to paint some stuff today as well. So this is it for this nerdy episode. Kind of an introduction to the borrow painting approach. There's a lot of stuff to discuss. I want to show you the proper HDR painting in 32-bit mode, which is a very heavy thing to work with, but it's a good thing for theoretical understanding of stuff. Also, right now I'm almost trying not to use my light palette or even this blending thing. Because I kind of understood this really well, and right now I'm moving forward, trying to combine all the colors in one stroke. This makes it a lot easier to create a very dynamic and confident strokes. So this is not the point to stop, this is just the theory part, to get a good idea of how colors work in nature. So I'm pretty sure it's gonna develop a lot and I'm gonna try and lose all the palettes and all that and just develop the actual theory of color for myself and for anyone who wants to know it in future to, to become an actual professional. I don't know, I'll just stop rambling because this is just a mess. I hope I will edit this down into something proper for the video. And I thank you for watching if you did, I guess you did if you're here. Leave a like and subscribe, tell a friend, drop some spots, do whatever you want. And I will see you in the next one. Bye!